So this week is a really short week, right? We had holidays for two days and once in a celebration we didn't have to go drag yourself back to reinforcement learning. <laughs> So we've got a couple minutes before we start, maybe we can go around the room just to introduce ourselves so you know who you're sitting next to instead of just perfect strangers. So maybe I'll start with myself. I'm Min, I'm an associate professor here at NUS. Uh, I do mostly in natural language research um, and a little bit of uh, information retrieval. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, Deep learning has affected so many different parts of uh, applications. That's why I'm conducting these, um, you know, more like seminar style uh, courses. And I think it's more fun for everyone to have a chance to study together. And this is why we make it open to the public. So, Hey, hello guys. Uh, I'm a fifth year PhD student working with Softman. And I have been working on problems uh, in, the, in the intersection of like natural language processing and recombination systems. Um, yeah, I'm glad to see you all here. And I'm also helping out me with like, conducting the courses. Yeah, so Tishala, you'll see him early every time. He's responsible for setting up our YouTube feed and everything like that. So, um, uh, yeah. Okay, let's go to the next question. Yeah. Can you introduce yourself a little bit and say a couple sentences just so that you know who your neighbors are in the class? Uh, I'm, I'm, younger. I'm younger. I'm a, I'm a year three student. I'm a My name is Yong Yang. I'm also a year one PhD student. Hi, uh, my name is Inkyet. Semester, year one, like first semester. You, all three of you yeah. are a CS yeah. in, in yeah, the yeah. department. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Wana. I attended the last session and did the one before that. Uh, I'm from uh, SS, a new SS. I'm lecturer there. I'm teaching Python and data science stuff. So it's got to be a machine learning guy. So, hi, my name is Marcus. Um, I run my own startup, uh, which is Labs. I've done my PhD 12 years ago in the stable databases, and I'm going to be helping um, companies in particular finance the domain. I had around Chino, I've done all the blogs, fighting financial crime. He's uh, um, had a piece of RD for like three lecturing years in the for I'm interested in uh, unsupervised learning, which I apply uh, for um, actual business problems, moving POC to production. And I know I have uh, some business use cases coming up where um, reinforcement learning might be useful. Thank you. That's from India. Yeah. And we've treated a couple emails, I think, before. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I used to teach a course that has no lecture on Right. <laughs> Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Jin Xiong. I'm from a uh, Mosaic Polytechnic. So currently I'm, uh, I'm a lecturer. So basically this field uh, have some interest in it. Uh, basically I have a master's in and uh, I was I think uh, this machine learning has actually got a lot of interest. I'm from Mosaic Polytechnic. I've taken the previous few years. Quite a while back. Yeah. yeah. Well, all of us are. Now we're on yeah. the lifelong learning trajectory of <laughs> stopping, right? So now uh, I'm back at some breathing space to see the latest. And uh, I spoke to you because my, my experience at remaining in your network is the need to reinforce the need. Okay. So, does it work? So, introduce ourselves? Yes, just uh, a short while. And then we'll go to the ones that are online because there are a couple of people okay. online as well. I'm Shenting. Uh, I just left Recash. I mean, the background is origin and stats. I did some deep learning research at Institute for Informed Research for a while. Then I went to Craftech uh, as a data scientist and I joined 
I, I went to UCSD to do a master's in computer science. And I came back and I was working as a data product manager in WeChat for two years before, almost two years before that. Um, hello, um, my name is Wei Xing. Uh, I am a master's student here at SOC. Currently, I'm working with uh, Prof. Ming and his PhD student, Wen Chiao. Yeah, so. um, hi, I'm Judy from uh, NLB, National Library. Great. So uh, we finished everyone but we sign. So okay. Um, we sign. So uh, I guess I teach here. I do research in machine learning and planning, trying to get more into reinforcement learning also. Okay. Kishul, you started the recording already? Yes. Okay. So then we can go to the people who are online. So I think on the screen at least, um, you have a couple people there, right? Can you show the, where's the hangout screen? Sorry, thanks. Yeah, so we have, uh, I think the first person on the, the left, maybe you can unmute your mic and tell us who you are. There might be some feedback from our side. Uh, yeah, I think it should be okay. I have a headset. Is there feedback? Yeah, no, it's fine for for, for uh, us. I'm worried about you. Yeah, it's okay on my side as well. So uh, I'm Alex. Um, I uh, a few years back I did a PhD in computational neuroscience in uh, in NTU here, and since then I've been working in, uh, in the industry as data scientist. So now I'm working remotely for uh, Seek, which is a online job portal, and. Uh, but I still keep on learning about uh, learning and uh, artificial intelligence and so on. So uh, I'm here uh, partly for uh, curiosity and uh, uh, also maybe for potential applications to, to my work. That's it. Great. Uh, can we have Ngo? So can you unmute your microphone and tell us about yourself? Yeah, hello. Um, so. Ng is my last name. My first name is Shi Kang. I recently graduated from NUS School of Business. Uh, I was doing a minor in computer science as well. So um, quite interested in learning about reinforcement learning, which is why I'm here. And hopefully in the future, I'm intending to perhaps do a master's or a PhD. Thank you. Great. Uh, Praveen? Uh, hi, I'm Praveen. Uh, I work as a software developer uh, uh, in a company called Freakout. Uh, it's in ad tech. Uh, so currently we have a, a real-time bidding system, uh, which is mostly rule-based. Uh, so uh, I was thinking I could uh, apply some uh, reinforcement learning to improve uh, the current system. That's why I'm uh, interested in this course. Great, and then our last person, uh, Vikash. Hi, I'm Vikash. Uh, uh, I work for OCBC Lab. I'm I'm just here to you know know about uh, reinforcement learning and how I can apply to solve the problems we are facing at the bank. I also took part in your previous lecture. Uh, the uh, deep learning uh, NLP is in deep learning, so I like the format. So I'm here for the second course. Great. There are a couple of you there, right? Uh, in OCBC, are yeah. you guys all in the same room together? Uh, I... Okay. Um, all right. Thanks, Vikash. Uh, then we have Ari. Do you want to say a little bit about yourself? We're just doing introductions. Is your microphone? Hi. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, so um, I work with a uh, startup. We do optimization, well, optimization stuff. I'm just curious about uh, machine learning, deep learning. So that's why I'm here. OK, great. So I, I think there are a number of us here in the room, uh, about a lot less than last time. It's going to go down a couple more. I think it's always the case. Um, but uh, we hope to have a steady state of at least 20 people. Um, and if we go to the deep reinforcement uh, learning uh, Google uh, Sheet, Maybe you can pull up that one. Or you can go to my screen. Even 
on this. Okay. Okay. I will share my screen. Um, you will see that uh, we have assigned people to different lectures. So <laughs> please take note of your lectures. Um, uh, I will be trying to put you into the slots that you have decided that you wanted. For example, Takanori, I think, uh, said he wanted uh, 5 or 13 as lecturer and 12, 11, 12 or 13 as a uh, scribe role. And I think uh, I've assigned him to these two slots. Um, and then similarly for today, because it's week four, uh, I don't think we're quite ready because it was a short week to assign anyone to to actually teach yet, so uh, we, we took it upon ourselves to do that. But we have asked Alex and Joel, hopefully Joel is around as well, uh, uh, remotely, to be able to take scribes down. So um, the way you do that is uh, we'll, we'll see how we uh, can work this out, but basically you can uh, open some type of document and on the Slack channel, basically uh, start talking about it uh, in the preparation. So uh, by going to the worksheet, for example, Marcus, you're responsible for 13 and 12 at this point. That means you would go to uh, week 12 prep and week 13 prep and add yourself to these two channels. Okay? And then at the appropriate time, uh, start talking with the, the people in that channel to prepare for, for the, the two responsibilities, okay? So um, I haven't assigned everyone. Uh, what I'm trying to do again is to make sure that we have enough people to cover all the different responsibilities. So I'm trying to make sure at least that the first part of the course we have enough uh, warm bodies to lecture uh, and then similarly for the scribe. So you should be assigned one to one. So there should be hopefully um, one person for uh, each person will have one of these two responsibilities. Anyway. Okay. So uh, I try to add yourselves. I will try to go through and, and check whether everyone is uh, there is supposed to be on that. So I think uh, me, I just yes. I just, just shared a, a I just shared an edited, editable document for for this week for uh, the Google Docs. I will take notes there. I don't know if Joel is around, but it's on the Slack, and other people probably can uh, can join as well. Right. Yeah. It seems like you can edit it. So if you guys want to open the link, please go ahead and, and help contribute. Uh, you can put your names on the scribe document. Uh, okay, so that you can get, um, you know, put your initials down to uh, next two things that you have added. And uh, do feel free to pull out uh, a lot of other material from other courses. I think on the Slack channel, there was a helpful tip uh, from Hao Kang uh, about the open AI course that was streamed only a couple days ago, I think earlier this month, uh, just five days ago, which is pretty, uh, I think pretty also quite useful because it's meant to be introductory, which is exactly what we're doing. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I think we can, um, you know, rather than watch this, we can uh, use the original slides. Should we do that? Let's see. It's open already. Okay, so you, you find it. I think this is the old one, yeah. Let me try to pull it up. We're just using the original ones from the course. We're on policy gradients. I've gone mostly through this. I think uh, we want to go through uh, this a bit more closely about the policy gradients. Remember all the parts that we talked about policy gradients for. Does anyone want to summarize the help out? Maybe a five minute summary. 
Samuel, you want to, um, did you want to give a summary? Okay, I guess we can try to summarize in the room first. Uh, first, what is a policy gradient method? Uh, I guess, okay, so this is what we are interested in maximizing. And this is this, is that right? Yeah, this guy, okay, this guy is what we're interested in maximizing. And I think the, the other day, I didn't quite mention this, but uh, the one reason this identity is very useful is it allows us to convert the gradient of the policy into sampling. You, know, uh, you guys notice this? Uh, this so this is what we want to optimize, maximize. So that's, this is the expected uh, reward of the trajectory. This is the probability of the trajectory, right? So integrate probability times reward gives you the expected reward. This is what we want to maximize. And we want to compute this using gradient ascent. And to do the gradient, we take the derivative mm -hmm. inside the integral. So we need to differentiate the policy. And this nice trick allows us to transform differentiation into sampling. Okay, so the gradient of the policy is the same as, I guess, multiply <coughs> this, divide by this, and this is the same as the derivative of the log of the policy. So we can take this, we can plug this in, and now we have an integral over the derivative of the log of the policy. And uh, since it's an integral, we can sample. I think I didn't quite go through that. So we have transformed derivative of the policy into sort of an approximation for which you can sample. Any comments on? So th this is the nice trick about, I guess, this identity. I, I don't, okay, the rest. Sampling comes with high variance, so then we end up uh, having two tricks, if I remember. Mm -hmm. but one is causality. Further down. Ah, this, this one. Uh, so this, after you transform it, and then you say, let's sample. This is the equation you get. And uh, this goes from one to t. You can rewrite this to a bit of maths and end up with the t. So the t goes from one to t, and then this part of the, the return only needs to start from uh, the particular t you are at. So you only need to take the sum of the rewards into the future with this, this uh, re rewriting of the equation. And by this causality. has lower variance. Go ahead. So it's, it's by causality that you can rewrite it. Uh, Why do we say that's causality? Because uh, what has happened, uh, I mean, what has happened now is, is what can I say, like, uh, I mean, it's there, right? It's like the policy at the time, T prime, it can affect the reward at time T when uh, it's in the it's T prime is in the future, future, meaning that what's happening in the future cannot act, cannot affect what's happened before. That's the intuition, I think. The math, uh, actually, I don't I think I've seen a proof, but I don't remember it. <laughs> but a lot of algebra. I think, I think what no, they did for the math was that they just, uh, because they knew by the assumption that what happens in the future doesn't affect the uh, current time. So they are estimating instead of uh, summing from one all the way to big T, they started from T, uh, from, from, from T, so that you only, yeah. yeah so, you, so you discard like the previous uh, 
so called factors. So that's why it's an estimation sign rather than the equality. Yeah, that's what happens. I think the previous uh, rewards are not shown only because it's a Q value now. <coughs> the Q value is a realized uh, but value. The Q is only from the state T equals to T. Is from that state where yeah, so a I can't teach. There's a Q hat next to the gridlock. Q hat IQ. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, so that uh, is a realized value. No, this this whole thing is the Q. Uh, this is like two or three slides. <laughs> Let's squash into one. Squash into one. one. Squat squat into one. one. The, yeah. the Q is the same as the sum of all the things in the. Going it's, it's just an identity from the. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he, uh, I guess Sergey did not go through the proof. He just said causality. So uh, I think if you want the proof, you will have to dig elsewhere. I don't know if somebody dig it out and put it on the on the slide. On the yeah. slide would be good. So yeah, a couple of you, if you want to do that, you can go. Uh, yeah. Like to yeah. yeah to go from this step to this step, like the, the mathematics to do that. Uh, the other. Trick so, is to okay. yeah. So why does that lower variance? Because now we sum less values overall, hence there is less deviation. But you have fewer numbers, fewer time steps yeah. to to pull it together. The magnitude is expected. The magnitude will be smaller in general, so your variance variances will be smaller because you're taking e of x squared minus uh, x. I think. That's another part of the trick is you know doing the baselines, which is the next part, right? Yeah. So when you want to lower the variance, uh, no, lower the magnitudes of the numbers, you can use the second trick. Yeah. So you center it so that that reduces the variance. So I think those were the two tricks that in this lecture. Uh, okay, and if you want to, you can write down the form of the variance, differentiate, and then find out what value will be of p is. This one that's optimal, uh, which is just a weighted version of the of the rewards. Okay, I think. Oh, okay. The other main thing we covered is what happens when we need to learn off policy. So why is off policy learning important, especially in the sense of a deep uh, reinforcement? Because on policy learning, you every time you change the value of theta, you will need to re-run through the deep, your network, the deep learning network again to be sample one. You sample again for your distribution. Right. So every time we update our policy and our, uh, our policy estimator, maybe just moving a, a little bit some epsilon value because we're doing gradient descent in the neural network. Then, if we only have an on policy way, then we have to throw away all of our samples off policy. It's a huge wastage because we're estimating all of these things just to improve the policy a little bit, and then we threw away all of our, all of our old estimates. So, what we'd like to do is use the previous estimates that you've already bothered to get to help improve the policy in previous iterations. Those are going to be off policy in general because they're not generated by the policy at the current time step but use them in such a way that uh, it can still help you figure out the gradient for the current policy, right? So the idea behind that is here on this slide, where the, the, the right-hand box is teaching a general concept of, you know, how do you weight a sample from, uh, from wherever, right? It could be on policy, it could be off policy, but how do you weight it such that you can um, effectively understand how likely that particular step is, right? Yeah, so it's a nice trick to know the important sample. So those are the equations, not that, not that messy, not that complicated. Four, four lines, so that's a nice trick. Nice trick to know. Anyone want to uh, try to explain what, what's going on in the green box and what, what type of intuition it stands for? Those of you online can also, uh, you know, just just raise your hand or yeah, unmute and, and chime in if you'd like.
So in the green box, what, what is actually happening in importance sampling is that they are switching out the, um, the, the expectation from the, uh, the expectation, the distribution whereby you are drawing the expectation from, from P uh, X to Q X. So that's the main thing. And then you're not, like, it, 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 in order to do that, in order for you to sample from a different distribution, you kind of have to multiply this, um, this factor, which is PX also QX. Uh, this one here, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is your ratio, and this is the original Q. Yeah. So I think, I guess, that you plug it in here, and then that gives you some things cancel, and let's see if we have an equation. But so this this becomes the new new equation. Yeah. So now you sample from a, a different, I guess, sample from which one? Okay. Yeah, sampling from a different policy, and you want to compute gradient with respect to your own policy. So you need to divide. The actual gradient with respect to your own policy, you need to divide it by the policy that the trajectory came from. So, so it's sort of reweighted. And that allows you to sort of do off policy, off policy, yeah, off policy, policy gradient. That's the main, main trick. Uh, Okay, I think this is a bit more preview of things that will happen in the course, so maybe we can avoid it. Uh, then I think there's some how to use TensorFlow, which uh, anyone wanna say any? Anyone have hands on doing this? Wanna say anything about using TensorFlow to do these things? I know there was some interest uh, by by different people on this. Uh, but one of the nice things about TensorFlow and other things like PyTorch is it does all the differentiation for you. You actually don't have to do that much work. You just have to, pop, um, I think Sergey mentioned, have to provide the, the, the right tensors and, and then everything else will, will come out properly. So he does tell you what you need to set up. Right? So there's some comments there that you have to build the, the graph, the computation graph, and then, um, yeah. TensorFlow will be doing the differentiation uh, right there in the yeah the negative likelihoods, and so, then you have to calculate the Q values. Yeah, so it seems you should be able to do maximum likelihood, and it's just a weighted version. I don't, I don't have hands on this, so somebody else can. But it's just a weighted version of maximum likelihood. So the tools should be there to be able to do it, uh, at least conceptually, uh, not too complicated. Actual implementation uh, has a lot of tuning doing reinforcement learning. <laughs> right, OK. Right. Tweaking is very hard. <laughs> Getting it to work, uh, you spend a lot of time tweaking it. Let's see. Gradients are very noisy. Okay, use larger batches if you can. So on. I think that's that's more or less. I think this he, he didn't go through this. I think that's it's things for the future. Okay, so I think that sort of summarizes the previous uh, lecture. Do we any Comments you want to discuss? Hi, uh, uh, I had a question about off policy learning. Okay, so, go ahead. So, uh, uh, in uh, in this slide of uh, uh, by import of policy learning by important sampling, uh, the notation here is uh, we are changing. Uh, uh, the random variable over which we are uh, get uh, taking expectation uh, uh, to pi bar of tau uh, uh, in the before slide uh, in the previous slide. 
previous one more fact this one previous yeah so this is pi bar of tau so uh, uh, we are changing from pi to pi some uh, different pi bar of tau so that mean uh, that means we are uh, uh, taking samples from a, a, a different uh, distribution uh, but in the next slide uh, uh, they they say that we change the uh, parameter theta uh, so uh, but in this equation it seems the policy is same only the parameter has changed so i i don't quite get this notation okay i, I think the notation he is using is because he is using the same policy uh, the same parametric form to generate the trajectories and then mm. now we are trying to learn it uh, use right at a different part of the parameter space the same but the same uh, same policy form is that uh, that right That's, can we estimate so oh, okay. so once so th this mm. is just an estimate of the uh, objective function right of the uh, expected value of the trajectories mm. so maybe i guess this is what you have and then what's the if i want to estimate the value at a new parameter that that's the value at the new prime of the same policy form of the same yeah that's why you just uh, sort of oh okay, that's why okay. you so, okay so we, we use the same policy uh, but with different parameters but we can still uh, reuse the previous sampling yes uh, the previous sample to oh. estimate the value at a different parameter okay sure then you can you. compute the gradient as well. Yeah, you can estimate the gradient. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Other questions that you guys have or anything that we want to discuss? I have a simple question. Have you specified? Good. How does policy relate to the parameters here? So, like, what is the mutual? Like, I believe it's like a neural network with some sort of dates that shows the data that I. Right? So, yeah. um, what is the intuition policy is related to the, when we change to a new set of parameters and sticking to the same policy means? Sorry. Like, so, a policy is a mapping like, from an input to an action. Yeah. Like input in this case, an image. So, mapping can be anything, deep neural network. So, different parameter value will give you different mapping. So, I think what he's so in a sense that the parameter is what carries the policy, right? The so weights of the neural network. The weights of the neural network, that's the parameter. So then you change the parameter to a new set of parameters, like totally different space, and it's still giving a very good uh, you know, policy. Uh, that pi, pi theta just now was like, a, uh, just add another policy, can you say that? Like, uh, maybe a good policy. It's usually a, a variant of your old okay. policy, uh, right? Because okay. you're doing gradient ascent, which means you adjust your parameters a little bit. So instead of turning right a little bit, you might turn right a lot or turn slightly less right, okay, for that specific state. But we don't want to jump around too much, right? Because uh, when we adjust our learning rate too fast, for example, then you go to another part of the state space and, and you won't uh, be able to learn well. You want to learn pretty smoothly uh, try to converge, um, you know, without having too many time steps. I think one of the complaints right now we have of reinforcement learning in general is it's very slow. Uh, if we want it to converge nicely, if we don't want it to jump around, right? because there's a lot of parameters to change. Does that answer your question? Anyone else want to add to that part of the discussion? You guys probably know more more details about this. Yeah. In a way that is actually helping. Right, exactly. So we want to choose, you know, for example, how how strongly we want to turn right given an image, for example. So we want to do that. So on this note, I have a question about uh, 
point in the implementation that say like uh, consider using larger batch sizes like is there any other benefit with respect to the obvious one like we need to update the parameters less frequently and regard to this well a lot of it i think has to do with um minimizing or, or uh, lessening the variance right because you you have a lot of problems of variance in in reinforcement learning because uh, you know you're going for so many time steps, and uh, after you go farther down in the time steps, your uh, estimations get more and more off, right? So by uh, having a larger batch size, uh, and you'll see this, I think, in the Q learning lecture today as well, is that um, when you have states that are somewhat close together, um, you know uh, what the neural network will do when it does the the critic. Uh, which we will talk about later, is uh, try to uh, average those values out. So let's say you came from, uh, you came to some state in the middle of your trajectory, but by two different paths. It might get two very different values, both of which are off, but uh, biased in some way. Then you average them together and then you get it. So hopefully that, that gives some information. To that. There, there are other reasons, right? Uh, it, it's an app <laughs> with many tricks. Uh, I don't know, I think if, as they go through the lecture, he will talk about a lot of the practical the tricks. It's a lot of art right now, how to, how to make things work. Does anyone else want to comment on, on that part? They, they also do something like um, experience replay, right? Yeah. That's like they collect the, the data, the example from the previous experiences. Um, that may be counting towards the best side. Yeah, so that, that's off policy learning. The experience you play is one example. So the off you gather the data for and then you, you then you try to train it from data that's gathered previously. Uh, well, once you have that then you can decide your batch size. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's move on, maybe. Yeah. All right. So uh, we'll move to the next one. Okay. So I actually have the the next slide that let me put on here. Slides. HTTP Bitly one hundred and one URL four. Look at that slide. And uh. For better results, I'll download it so that we have it full screen on the on the presentation computer. I will open it for this. So uh let's see. Okay. So uh, we're going to go through actor critic algorithms and uh, Q learning today. Oh no, it's on slideshow. So I think many of you know uh, more about this than I do. I just learned it this morning. So um, uh, I hope you will try it. So we're supposed to go over uh, what we're doing now is saying, you know, we have the policy gradient algorithm already, which is directly trying to estimate what our policy is and improve it. Uh, but maybe we could introduce something else, a, a critic that could help uh, determining uh, a middle point, you know, assessing whether a state or an action is good, and then talk about the policy evaluation problem, and then how to deal with the infinite uh, case uh, where we have a task that can go on forever. So um, what we we're going to talk about at the beginning works very well for finite cases, but in an infinite horizon case, it doesn't work very well. And there's a very easy way to solve that, which is the uh, idea of a discount, which actually serves two different purposes, um, and it uh, arrives at the actor critic algorithm. OK, so uh, let's go through what that is. So we already know what the policy gradient is, right? We have this box that uh, Sergey mentioned to us before. Let's see whether I can get something to uh, well, 
not going to work on here, I think. Yeah, never mind. Okay, so we have this uh, cycle that's an, in all of our reinforcement learning algorithms. Again, just to make it clear, we're first going to uh, have a policy, and after we have that policy, we're going to generate some samples or trajectories from the policy, right? And then we want to, uh, in some cases, fit some type of model to uh, estimate the, the value of those particular uh, samples, right? And what we want to do is then improve the policy by, for example, making the uh, samples that uh, had high reward or, or better outputs more likely than average than the ones that have lower performance, right? And so there are different ways of doing it um, in the imitation learning and uh, the basic policy method, you could say, OK, we can take a Monte Carlo idea um, and just basically sum up all of the rewards uh, from all of the time steps from uh, t prime equals t to capital T, right? And that would give us uh, um, a Q value for that particular policy for a particular sample, OK? So um, that leads us to the reinforce algorithm, which has those three steps, right? The sampling is the orange box. Then the, uh, we have the uh, summing up of all of the rewards here. And then finally, updating the, the policy directly by taking the learning rate alpha and then timesing it by the gradient of the policy. So uh, one thing we can do is think about the uh, estimate of the expected reward if we take a certain action, right? Uh, so we're going to introduce this idea of this reward to go. So uh, you can give me a definition of what this means. What does reward to go mean? Is that a, a fala? You said future rewards? How so? So we have, um, you know, a state from uh, T, T prime equals one to capital T of all of these uh, rewards, right? So I'm basically saying I'm sitting at a state, uh, some particular state SI, and then taking an action, um, one particular action here, and I'm getting a reward for that particular action, right? And I'm going to do it all the way until the end of the time steps, right? So that's my reward to go from a particular uh, time step and given a particular action. Uh, uh, not, sorry, not an action, uh, being in a particular state at a particular time step, right? Okay, so uh, can we get a better estimate? So what can we do? So, see the slides are a bit messy here. Anyone want to help out? Right. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Um, uh, uh, it's unrelated. I mean, that Joel is in the US right now. Uh, so maybe you could ask the prof for the original uh, PowerPoints so that we have, you know, the transitions and we can look at them instead of looking at the, you know, the mangled thing. Uh, we can try to get them, yeah. We can ask Sergey whether he's willing to share them with us, yeah. So that's a good suggestion. We'll ask him later offline. Um, so, in the, in the YouTube video, they did mention like the slack for these operations. So, they actually posted uh, last year's version of the slides, and the quality is better. So, I'll, I'll link that. Can you put it on the Slack? Yeah. Okay, then we can pull it up right now. Okay. Well, in the meantime, I just want to double check on the reward to go function. Like the summation just starts from P to big T, right? Not from one. Because right. this is starting from one right now. From T. From a particular state. Right, right. Like taking an action. Right. From there until the trajectory. Right. So that's where the T prime starts. Right. So I think over here you that's see it goes yeah, from so T to uh, uh, capital T, right? Right, right, right? So this is the idea that uh, you don't have to, uh, you know, this is the causality 
part that we were talking about last time, right? Where we don't need to sum up everything from the from the beginning, just taking from the current time step, right? Yeah. And then so like the top, from there. the top formula is is wrong. That one starts at back here. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think I think you mentioned it is also a typo in, in in the in the cast. Yeah. Let's see. We do it. Okay. Thanks, Ning. Okay, so we can get that one corrected. Okay, and then uh, what about the baselines? We talked about the baselines last time, right? Uh, to uh, take out some constant that we can uh, factor out so that the variance is lower, right? So what can we do there? Right, well, we can uh, define are these ideas of a Q function, a value function, and a advantage function. Right, so these are pretty uh, easy to understand. Um, does anyone want to give these definitions of what Q, uh, V, and A mean? So those are, uh, I think everyone needs to know those at some point. We can start with Q, right? Q says, um, what's the value of this state given a particular action, right? So it's the total amount of reward that I get for taking a particular action at some time step, right? So if I'm in the current state now and I have one of several uh, actions to take, I can take any one of those. And then I'm going to define this quantity Q of this particular policy because it's specific to that policy of how worthwhile it is to go uh, take that action, right? Okay. And then uh, V is a generalization of this. This value function is just the total reward from that state. So you can think of uh, V as some type of expected value of taking any action Q from, from that V, right? So then it's natural to think, okay, if I'm in a current state, okay, and you can think of this quite easily in, in like game playing, right? So if you look, if a chess master looks at a board, right, uh, is it a, uh, it, it gives a value to that board. What is that? Is that a Q value or a V value? It's a V, right? So you're looking at the state of the world, uh, hopefully fully observable, but you know, maybe you have a model representation that you're representing in some way. You're saying, how, how good is this state to be in? So that makes a lot of sense for game playing or, or you know, if you've watched any of the, the open AI things, right? They, they have this chart about how likely it is to win. The agent thinks it's to win. That would be the A value of the current Right, so if it's 99%, that means that's a pretty good state for the agent, right? And then Q is then uh, conditioning on that and saying, you know, I'm in this state, but I've got a lot of different actions to choose. For each action, what's the expected value, right? So A is measuring the difference, right? It's just defining that if I take the Q value and subtract the V value, then I can get sort of a relative score of that action, right? So that's why it's called an advantage function. So if it's positive, it means it's a better than average move. If it's worse than that, that means it's lower than average. And of course, when we set our policy, we want to set it in such a way that we uh, heighten the possibility that we take actions that are, uh, are going to have an advantage of positive, right? right. So uh, the important thing here is uh, we've already talked about uh, you know doing the policy gradient, which is on the third line here, right? So we just want to make sure that we can uh, have this particular estimate as uh, best as possible, right? And we can do that by, for example, 
uh, just summing up all the rewards, but because we are going to all the time steps, that's going to have high variance. So while it, it's not biased because we're taking expectation over all possible trajectories from that time point, it's probably not a good idea, right? Because the farther away in the future you go, the, the less um, uh, valuable your predictions are because there's so much uh, error in your predictions, right? You want to add on anything? Okay, so what are we going to do then is instead of actually summing up all the rewards and getting an expected integral over all of these expectations that you have on the red line, right? Um, so summing up all the expectations of the uh, values from that time step all the way until the, the finishing of the task, what we're going to do is we're going to fit a neural network to do this job. Right, so we already have a neural network that's going to give us our policy. Now we're having a, another neural network that's going to be evaluating how good the state is. Right, so that's why we have this uh, B hat. Right, it's a, a basically it's a uh, neural network that's going to look at the current state and then say how good it, that state is. Right, it's not making a decision about what to do. Right, it's not telling you turn left, turn right or cast a spell or put the stone here. It's just saying, how good is that board? Or how good is this, this scene? Does it look like I'm gonna drive into a wall or is it like smooth sailing? Okay, so there's two different neural networks at play here. There's an actor, which is our policy, and our critic, which is just telling you what's the state of the world, how good is that for me? Okay, so there are different things that you can fit. You can fit the Q value directly Right, so uh, so he asks, you know, this question up here: Should I fit uh, a neural network to estimate the Q value, or the V value, or the advantage function? And actually, you can do all three of these. He says there's definitely uh, algorithms for these two. He doesn't know of any for this. I don't know whether there are any. Okay, um, but uh, at least uh, for uh, we can express the Q in terms of V. Okay, so if we really want to get this, uh, you know, advantage then why don't we just um, fit the V function, right? So he goes through some details on this, uh, basically saying that, oh, well, actually, we, we don't need the Q function directly. We know the reward, okay? The reward is, um, is a known value, okay? It's basically just what happens when you assign a value to, from a state T, uh, from a state ST to uh, take the action AT, we're getting a specific reward. So there is no estimation there. That's a, a, a known value, right? So uh, we also have these two parts here, right? The uh, the v values for uh, uh, the previous, the current time step, and the next time step, right? We subtract these two together, and then we'll have uh, what we'll need. Okay. So uh, then there are a couple. Uh, tricks to do uh, for that, right? We, we can try to figure out um, what amount uh, we are going to use for V pi, right? By uh, summing up all of the rewards. This is the Monte Carlo policy evaluation, right? This is what the original policy gradient algorithm does, right? Just go through all the different uh, trajectories and try to add them together, okay? Or we can try to do uh, you know, some type of, of resetting, right? So what we, how, how do we read this notation here? Here we have capital T. Oh, this is this is this case where we have the baseline, right? So we have from, uh, instead of, is that right? One, uh, it's when you, uh, when you reset the, uh, when you can come back in time always to your, uh, your, uh, your, you know, to your green green point and uh, and start from the same conditions again, but uh, get a slightly different sample. Uh, so it's only in simulator that you can do that. Okay, great. Yeah, so that's right. So it's just to, to say that we, we can run a couple iterations, right? Sample additional trajectories. So what we're going to do here is just sum together all of the rewards over all of the trajectories and divide through the amount we have to lower the gradient uh, uh, variance. Yeah. So why is this better than um, you know just?
doing what we were doing previously in the policy gradients, right? Um, one of the good things about this is that if you have a couple different points in your space when you sample the gradients, uh, sorry, sample the trajectories, right? You might get spaces, uh, sorry, you might get samples from nearby uh, state space, right? So if you have these two green dots, they might be uh, close to each other in the state space, but have uh, quite different values in terms of their estimates for your V. And so uh, because they have different values, you can average them out. Okay. So uh, in fact, because you're going through the uh, supervi supervision through the neural network, uh, it can uh, try to generalize you know, to other states that are nearby. For example, let's say there's another green dot somewhere over here or over here. Um, it might assign a value even though it's off the policy, off, off any uh, samples that we've seen before. It would give a reasonable estimate to that because it's already been learned. Right? We have uh, a, a neural network that can spit out a, uh, a V value, an approximate V value for any state. Okay, so there's uh, some savings instead of doing it just through the policy gradient. Okay. Sorry, you, can you say it again? Yeah. About the variance, why why is it better? Or okay, uh, the reason why it's better is because that you can you know when you go through these trajectories, right? You could go through it and arrive in many different uh, ways to the same state, right? So when you do that, you would get different v values because you're taking different trajectories. Okay, so you might arrive at uh, approximately the same state or even the same state, but having different uh, values for your estimation, right? But in the gra a policy gradient method, we're not sharing any of these histories together. Each one is separate. But when we are training it through the neural network, it can try to generalize from all of these different uh, experiences. So it's sort of averaging, doing some averaging for you. So that should end up with lower variance because it's average. The neural network's average. So, I have a question. Here. So, um, so all this algorithm is doing right now, I know later, like, they, they need it. But for now, what it's really trying to do is it takes in all the data points of um, the V, and then it fits a model to it, and it uses the model to predict the same data points in sample. Right? It does not actually. So I'm not too sure, but it feels like it does not actually try to um, predict any new V for a new state, but just the states that it has already encountered in sample, and it just does the averaging to like reduce the variance in sense. All right, because ultimately this all these states will be used to fit the policy gradient, so there's actually no inference being done using the model. The model is simply a better uh, I think that's correct. Right? Uh, at this point in the lecture, I'm not so sure, okay. but usually you would use it to, to generalize. Okay. Uh, in most practical, uh, I guess at this point, we are probably not at a practical algorithm. Right, so right, maybe right. State yeah, space possibly. Of, uh, any simulator, right? mm. So in a sense, the, the whole environment is, is well known to the, to the agent. It's up to the agent, like what is its visibility, like what is its interpretation of the model. Like, you know, from the environment, just to come up with the model, the uh, view of the model. Mm -hmm. uh, so the environment is uh, it's, it's fully absorbed in this case, I believe it's, it's correct, like it's fully absorbed. Right? So in that sense, uh, the whole state space is there. There is no new states. It's like, so every time when the agents, uh, when there is a new state, when there is a state being fed, it comes up with a new value. The state is going to be the same for the whole game or for the whole simulator. There is no new state. But it's mostly color, right? So yeah. like, well, I, I think we still will encounter new states. No, yeah. Because it might be continuous, right? Like discrete state. So with that continuous state, it's impossible for you to have data point for every single state. And so even when we generate yeah. trajectories, even if it's a finite world, we're not going to generate uh, and touch yeah. every state. Yeah. So your, your neural net actually, what it does is, it, I think if you train it well, it will approximately say like for maybe this, this bunch of state, what is the relation, how it actually maps to the 
final outcome. Mm. Like matrix it out, we should be able to generalize that. Uh, apparently, this is not practical yet, so <laughs> we'll see. But but my, my, my question is just that it does not do inference on new states to estimate the value for that new state, right? It only estimates on existing because it's the, the states will be used to do policy gradient. So we are just inserting a step into train and then predict on the same states. Yeah. In, in general, you want it to generalize. Right. At yeah. this stage, right. I'm not so sure. <laughs> but in the practical algorithms, you want yeah. it. Yeah. Right. So I think you're correct at this point. You we're not trying to generalize for it, but you get the benefit of having a generalized model coming out of it, right? Because you can feed it any state, and it will still give you a V value back, right? So that's what we, we want to get, because we want to have a model of how what what the state looks like and how valuable those states are but at this point we're not doing that we're just saying i have some trajectories and i want to find their values i already have their values but i'm going to fit a model to that value and i'm going to use something like supervised regression which can do something like uh, optimize for l2 loss right so that's what we're doing here just a root mean squared error right for of what we actually think the value is and what the the network uh, has approximated its value as, right? And we're going to just continue to iterate, uh, train the neural network until it minimizes this, this, this error, right? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, can we do any better than that? Um, so one of the big problems with, with what we've just done is that uh, we are doing, I think, um, just uh, the, the value function uh, for that particular policy, right? But um, when we change the value, uh, when we change the policy, then uh, our entire evaluation of the network or the value function needs to be retrained, right? Because we have a new, we have a new policy now, so we need a new evaluation method for that, um, for the policy. Right, for the for the uh, B values, but uh, we don't need to do that necessarily, right? What we can do is we can still reuse the uh, previously fitted value function, even though it's no longer valid. It's not a, a valid estimate anymore because we've changed our policy, right? So if we've decided to put a stone here instead of there, then uh, the way that we value the board should have changed, right? But in many cases, we want to do this because it's even though it's not valid, it's a, a good approximator and it doesn't cost uh, as much, right? Maybe we can still say, because we've only used a, a adjusted our uh, policy a little bit, those previous uh, value function estimates that we got from our neural network are still pretty good, they're pretty accurate, right? So uh, we're going to do that um, and, and use this instead. Mm -hmm. Any questions on that? Okay, so he goes through a, a couple of the policy evaluation uh, examples, right? So we have the first one that's quite old, from 1992 on uh, uh, TD Gammon, where this is a partially observable MVP, and AlphaGo, which is deterministic, right? Both of these have the same idea, which is that uh, you're trying to fit a neural network uh, to approximate your value function, the value of that board at that time instant, right? And then uh, basically the outcome here is normalized to zero or one. So zero means you lose the game, one means you win. So you have some uh, probability estimate of how likely that is from a particular board position. So I think here he's just saying that, okay, uh, We've actually come up with this idea of the actor critic algorithm, right? Before in the policy gradient, we were only directly changing the policy. Now we have another neural network that's job is to fit this V hat uh, pi, right? Uh, which is the green box. So instead of doing the, the uh, expectation of the rewards by summing up all the rewards in the trajectory, we're actually introducing a model, right? So the model is the neural network. It's supposed to be able to give you the value of any state. Um, you just plug that in, like the pixels from the camera or the 
the board position in Go, and then it'll just spit out a number that says this is how valuable that is. Okay. All right. So now you are no longer looking at the whole trajectory. You're only looking at one R S I A R. Every every time, yeah, you only look at one, and the rest you are using the neural networks to give you values. Right, so all, all of these other things here, they come from your uh, network approximator, right? So this is what we've trained, and then uh, we're going to plug these in to get these two values. And this is the only thing we already know, right? Because whenever we take a, a step, uh, we have a, a, reward, a reward associated that we've uh, assigned it, right? Okay, and when, then we use this uh, to go ahead and uh, evaluate our uh, policy and take a, a small step, right? A uh, step modified by our learning rate in the direction that's going to improve our policy. All right? Uh, what, is, what is the actor critic like? Who is the actor and who is the critic? What that's a great question. Working? Okay. <laughs> so who's acting? The agent is acting. The critic is the value of the yes. The agent is the actor. Agent is a policy. The the agent policy is the policy. Is the right? You yeah, remember. I think you call, you call it an agent critic. Yes. <laughs> just curious yeah. where the actor comes from. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's taking actions. Oh, That's why it's an actor. Okay. It's taking actions. It's not MOFA. It is, I guess, it's movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's taking <laughs> actions. <laughs> So if Brad Pitt was at the steering <laughs> wheel, then you can think of that. <laughs> so uh, again, the policy is the actor, right? Because the policy is saying, I see some input, I do some action, right? So uh, policy and actor, I guess, are synonymous here. Right, so our blue box is the policy, right? That's the actor. <laughs> our green box is the critic, right? It's telling you how valuable this thing is. So those are the two components. They can be represented by any function approximation, but in deep RL, it's always going to be some type of number. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, it's like an implementation. So suppose we have like a uh, uh, hundred rods, right? And each rod is a finite horizon space, so it's let's say ten steps. Okay. So in total, we're actually sampling a um, uh, hundred times ten, so it's a thousand um, actions. Right. But in the fitting, we are only fitting the reward sum. So we are only fitting a hundred rewards. So we are only fitting a hundred data samples. Is it? But then when we evaluate, because we are evaluating for every single action, we evaluate a thousand different actions. Oh, we could uh, evaluate for any number, right? So it, it, after you build a network and you've uh, train it over uh, those 100 rollouts with a horizon of 10, right? And you can use that train model to evaluate over all states, over all actions, right? Mm -hmm. Because you only sample 1,000. Right. OK, but Other questions? Uh, hi. Yeah? Uh, so our uh, value, uh, uh, the value function, it's uh, dependent on pi, so uh, it's, it's the same problem again as uh, uh, on policy learning that uh, if we change our policy, uh, then uh, the value function, uh, uh, because its ex uh, value function is the expected uh, rewards over our current policy. So if the policy changes, uh, uh, so, so so the point is the value function is uh, dependent on the policy. So we, do, uh, we have to recalculate the value function uh, or uh, we can, uh, I mean, how to solve the problem like uh, like we solved for the offline uh, of policy learning. Yeah, that's generally the problem is that whenever you have changed your policy, you also probably need to retrain your value algorithm. Right. Let's say let's say you're a chess agent and you decide at the beginning that pawns are really valuable, right? So your value function reflects that belief in the world. But later you find out, oh, okay, because the queen can come out later in the board game, that queens are actually much more valuable than pawns.
response, right? So you don't want to be using your old uh, estimator of the value function to 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 uh, inform your policy. So these two have to uh, mutually evolve or be trained uh, to to reflect the best action, right? If you stay with an outdated value function, then it won't uh, correctly express the way towards an optimal policy, right? So you do need to eventually throw away uh, old estimates or use important sampling to downweight uh, previously important samples which are no longer consistent with the, your current beliefs about what is important. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Yeah. So we can use the important samples here also. Uh, you probably could, but as currently decide, uh, this crack in the slide, you can see it's a loop. Right after step five, you go back and you sample a new new batch. Uh, mm. but yeah, uh, there's online versions that keep doing it, but I guess this is a batch version. But previously, there was a, there was a bootstrap estimate, right? Like the previous slide. Uh, mm. slide uh, yeah, so, so yeah, I think you're actually reusing your previous, um, the, the V here at the training data that is from your previous uh, policy. Oh, right, the training oh, okay. yeah. I think you, you still need to renew it from time to time, otherwise it starts to so you, you, train, uh, you train a new approximator based on um, the training data, which is kind of different. From, the, the first one you train, you are just training with the R, the R portion, and then like your second iteration, I think you train with the R plus your previous uh, pop, uh, value approximator as a label. Yeah. So yeah, you are using them in that sense, but you got to retrain everything. Yeah, so I think uh, Wee-san is right uh, when uh, I think uh, Sergey went over this. He said this is basically um, a looping structure that you can just, uh, at, at the worst, you would take a batch size of one, which means you just roll out one time and then re-estimate your, uh, your value function just based on one trajectory. But ideally, if you have the way of simulation, right, you could run multiple of these. And I think he discusses this next, right? Okay, so there was this other part about, you know, how to deal with uh, finite cases, which is what Bala just asked about, which says that that is a good thing. Uh, we can uh, do these rollout for finite time steps. But what happens if you have an infinite uh, task? Like, for example, the one on the right over here, where basically your job is to keep the runner um, upright all the time and running all the way to the right. So if you have rewards that are positive at each time step, you have this problem where if it's an infinite horizon, your rewards blow up, right? You get everything infinite, so there's no way to learn anything from that case, right? So uh, well, that, that's a, a, a very big problem, right? So if you look at the MVP, right, the uh, decision process, let's say here at the original uh, times uh, before the animation, there's just four uh, states. Okay, so they can transition to each other with some transition probability. That's fine, right? So uh, what we can do is think about uh, how to deal with this infinite case, right? So one way we can think about it is um, we can have a trick where we say that uh, it's better to get the reward sooner than later, right? So this is the idea of uh, using a discount factor, right? So the idea is that if you get the reward now, it's more worthwhile than having the reward later. And there are several reasons for that. So Guy, can you tell me what are some reasons for that? Rewards later tend to be higher in variance because you have to walk the policy further into the future, which you don't know um, what, what kind of value to put at stake. Exactly, so that's one of the key findings is that if you roll too far out in the future, right, your, your estimates are wildly off, right? So even though it might be unbiased, they're almost always wrong by a, a large margin. So we want to discount those high variance estimates anyways. So it's probably good to downweight them, right? So you can't predict, like, say, what, what you're going to be doing 10 years from now, right? So we're just going to discount that a lot, okay? So the other way you can think of it is uh, you also prefer to have the reward sooner in case you uh, end up with some type of uh, problem with your uh, your your agent, for example, let's say you crash into a tree, well, then your agent's dead, right? So you can think of this uh, as a, a discounting mm -hmm. factor, right? So you're going to say that uh, 
when we're doing our transition, we're going to have our reward, but there's also a non-zero probability uh, that, uh, sorry, over here, uh, that we are going to transition uh, with this um, gamma here to, uh, uh, you know, a final state where you're dead. Okay. So I, if you roll this out infinitely, as long as uh, gamma is some positive number, then you're always going to be dead in the time limit, right? So what we'd uh, like to do is uh, just discount the rewards, right? To say that uh, we're going to get a reward at a certain time step, but then say that the future rewards as represented by a V in the future at uh, T plus one is going to be discounted, right? So if our discount factor is at zero, that means we, we don't take any of the future rewards into account. I'm being greedy. I just take one time step. And if I take one, then we have the original equation where we're never uh, we don't worry about this count. Okay. So then there are two ways of applying the idea of discounts. And I didn't quite get this. So if you remember where this is coming from, please help out. Um, I think you mentioned that there are two different options. One that has to do with exactly what was said before, where we are, um, worried about high variance coming from rollouts that are farther in the future. And then another version, uh, which is uh, dealing with more short-term uh, improvements. So uh, these two options, you expand option two out, and you'll get something like the bottom line here, which is almost equivalent, I think, to the top line. Right. So these two lines, option one and option two here, are the same except for this part here, right? I think this is the only factor that's different, okay? And what he's saying uh, here is that uh, this is basically the bottom option two is uh, a, a discount factor um, that is uh, heavily favoring uh, rewards at the current or close to current time step. Okay. So uh, that seems to make a lot of sense. We would say if, if we have an agent that's going to you know, eventually stop in some way, we might as well take our rewards uh, earlier. So we should discount later steps uh, more. So that would seem like the natural option to do is option two. But in uh, practical cases, people do option one. OK, in, in practice. Um, we said you uh, and yeah, I watched that part. So I think I think he said option two is mathematically the correct way, but in practice, uh, people do option one uh, because in practice you don't actually want to discount. Uh, primary, at least for those kind of application he is interested in, you don't want to discount uh, the future too much. It seems so. Uh, but you want the discount, the reward further into the future to take care of the variance. Because the estimates are quite bad, you might as well get rid of it. So I think that's what he said from this, from the video. Then I, yeah, I remember that too. Yeah. yeah, he said that, you know, in the case of this running character, right, if you discount too much to the front, you know, just optimize the stand at the beginning and then it'll fall down. So uh, you prefer not to use something like option two for anything that's non-episodic, you know, something that's continuous and, and long-term cyclical. You would want something that uh, has a less, uh, less uh, stringent discount at the beginning towards, towards that uh, gamma factor at the front. Okay, so then there are basically these two algorithms, which are uh, pretty much identical, I think, just that uh, we have two different ways of uh, dealing with. Do we have a comment from anyone? Uh, Taka, do you have a comment that you want to uh, raise? Oh, okay, you muted, I guess not. Okay, so uh, I don't think I have anything to say about this one. 
think the one common we had here was that um, so the main difference is whether you take a batch size of more than one or you just take one action, which is means that your end is going to be Then the main comment is that online one doesn't work. But he said you're explaining later why online doesn't work. Okay, yeah, I think he did explain later uh, why the online algorithm needs some modification, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll go on from there. So um, the architecture design is, uh, he said, there's basically two ways of dealing with this, right? So you have a, an actor network that's uh, just trying to decide the policy and you have a critic uh, network that's trying to decide the value of the state, right? So the, the standard way you, you can do it is, for example, have two specific networks designed for each of these two things, right? So this is easier to tune because they're separate things. Uh, but there's the problem that if it's a very complex space, you might actually want to learn certain features that are shared between the actor and the critic. Right? So if you're driving and you see a big rock on the road, that should look bad for the, the value operator. It also should tell your, your algorithm you need to go either to the left or the right, not stay on course. Right? So um, you don't have that in this case. The other way to do it is something like uh, on the right-hand side, which is a shared network design. Right. So basically, you have two uh, soft maxes or something uh, coming out of the network at the penultimate layers, for example, which would allow you to predict uh, the, the, both the value, uh, which is the critic, as well as the policy. All right, but those are harder to tune because it actually has to do two different things at once. Right? That should be fairly straightforward. So. Um, Online actor and critic in practice, right? So you said in certain cases when you can parallelize it, right? You would have a, a you know whole set of computers um, uh, simulating this, right? So each one could do a, a specific rollout, right? And then when you've gathered all of the data, then you can update, uh, synchronize up, and then update all of the parameters for uh, your policy network. Right, and do this over multiple time steps. Um, when you have parallel workers to do both the uh, creation of the value network as well as updating the policy. Right, the other way you can do it is asynchronous, um, and, and that is just you you have each of these act um, uh, worker threads uh, calculating some values of uh, the states, and then when you have enough of these, you meet some threshold. Then you say, okay, I've gotten, let's like, say, 10 estimates, then I'm not gonna wait for anyone else. I'm just gonna go ahead and update the, the parameters of the network. Uh, the policy network, sorry. Uh, I don't recall what this is about. Does anyone wanna say anything about this slide? Yes, this is. This is a Bias comparison. And variance trade off. So, policy gradient, because you are taking the whole trajectories of the reward, usually has high variance. Right? And then we use actor critic to reduce the variance, but it's actually biased because the critic's always wrong. But we, we talked about different problems, right? It's updated and this and that. It's a function approximator, so it may fail to approximate certain parts of the space well. So the the critic's always wrong, so it's, it's not unbiased, it's biased, uh, but it has lower variance. So you are trading off lower variance with uh, higher bias. I think that, that's sort of typical sort of trade off with at the critic policy critic. So you're summing the rollouts reward, then you think the estimate the the one is the the third line? Yeah. You start the rollout, a light policy right, but the baseline is but they change the baseline, yeah. So he's yeah, so that unbiased and lower variance that's one. Yeah, so that one's unbiased. Yeah. And use a baseline which is sort of learned. 
So here's our baseline over here, right? Yeah. This is being learned by the value function, but since you're uniformly applying it, you're not adding any bias, right? Because you could choose any baseline. Right, so you're, you're keeping the policy gradient part of it. It's just that your B is uh, being chosen from the actor critic, from the critic. So it's not, I guess, it's not a constant, not a B constant. So now it's state dependent. The B is state dependent. So it should be, hopefully, be able to reduce the variance more than the constant. So I think in the cast, there was somebody who asked a question about how this differs from the like optimal baseline that we saw when we reviewed it just earlier, right? So um, when we were doing important sampling and we said, you know, we can take uh, uh, estimates from uh, previous cases and we can find out the optimum baseline to subtract, that was a baseline that was not state dependent, that is uh, for, for the entire policy, right? So this one, as we son just mentioned, this is a state dependent uh, uh, baseline that you're subtracting away, right? So even though it's unbiased, it is hopefully going to give you a better estimate because it is specific to the state. We want to go over this control variance. In this this one they say you can also make the uh, Q, okay, the baseline dependent on the action. actions right yeah. not not quite apparently it, it breaks but you can correct for it to fix it which is the I guess the last one of the formula uh, unless somebody wants to discuss it. Maybe can skip. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, yeah. so you want to reduce the variance as much as you can. So I guess if you can use the action as well, you will hope to reduce the variance for them. But it breaks and you have to fix it. Okay, so um, we come to the point where there are two different ways of doing your um, estimate. So right now, for example, we have the reward for one time step. Okay, from uh, at state T, we take the action A and we have a reward for that. And when we are trying to compute these two values through our value network, right? Through our critic, right? So that's in the case of just one time step, right? But in fact, we can do something that's called n step returns, which is to say, instead of just doing one step and getting the actual value of the reward and then um, approximating the rest, uh, we can do it for m multiple time steps, right? Uh, so, uh, right. So, if we do it uh, using the actor critic uh, method, we have this lower variance because we've inserted this model of how our Vs look like, right? This is our 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 critic. But it has higher bias because, as uh, Wee Sun said, um, whatever type of network we have here, it, it will only be able to represent certain hypotheses, right? Then the non-biased way, which is our policy gradient method, uh, basically uh, does the expectation over all of the rewards through all time steps, right? But it will have higher vari variance because you only have uh, estimates from a single sample. So the idea is to combine these two. So instead of having a roll up, um, uh, a reward calculated just for one time step, maybe you calculate it for two time steps. So you have reward of S to T to A T plus the reward from the next time step from uh, T plus uh, S T plus one and A T plus one. So that would be counting two 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 steps in the future. So that part would be deterministic. It would. Uh, 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 even further uh, lower your variance, but it would have uh, even higher bias, right? Because you have more uh, information going into your training. Okay, so uh, you can do any number of steps, right? Uh, what we're doing in actor critic, uh, just the basic algorithm is one step estimate. But if you move it several steps, then you can get more accurate estimates, but at the cost of uh, more bias, right? You have a uh, lower variance, but higher bias. So why not get the best of both worlds? So they said, uh, what we can do is we can do n-step returns instead of just doing one 
or two or three, what we can do is blend several of these together. So you can do a one step as well as a two step and then use a weighting factor to combine these two together in such a way that you get uh, a, a good uh, control between bias and variance both ways, okay? So important thing here is, uh, as this diagram says, uh, as we alluded to before, is that we want to uh, not really use all of the variants out here. All the estimations out here are so wild because the rollouts are so far in time. We're going to downplay them as much as possible, right? So we're going to cut off the variants and then use the, uh, the actual sampling to get the right uh, amount later on. Anything you want to add? Any other discussion points here? So yeah, the last equation sort of the end step. So you sum from D prime equals to D to D plus N. And then you do the, the remaining part. Yeah, so this is your remainder here, mm -hmm. right? So you do the discounting over the remainder, and then you have your, your value function at that point in time. Okay, so I think we we just covered this as, as, yeah, as well. This, this is, is the, the one where you when blend all the blend, blend the Yeah, so you, you basically have, you know, different uh, values which you can set to say whether I trust the, uh, the one step more than the two step less and then the three step even less, right? So he says normally that this is done in some type of exponential fall off because the more steps you roll out, uh, of course, the more uh, variance there is. So this exponential fallout also gives a nice, simple update, the second last line. Yeah, that, so it gives a nice, simple update. So if you use this particular way to combine the different advantage over different ends, the update equation is uh, simple. So that's all we wanted to say for this lecture. So um, I think, yeah, there are some uh, classic readings here and Alex can uh, pull out some of these um, and then we can discuss them offline in the, in the Slack if you'd like. Um, and then I think we'll turn to the next part of the lecture, which is on the, what was it, Q learning uh, next. But uh, we'll take a short break uh, and we'll find the next slide part of the deck. Was there another link for the, the next lecture? Yeah, okay, if you just get rid of the, the lecture file but the, and go to the S17 docs. It's a, okay. it's a directory. Ah, uh, okay, great. Yeah. So we'll just do that. Okay. So uh, we'll come back in five minutes, okay, and we'll start the. the the value function lecture. Yeah, Q learning. So we won't get all the way through, but everybody will get. Yeah, I know. I I hope we can move about one and a half. Two hours. Those lectures are, yeah. I think we have to go over everything. Just 